Now is the knowing, being alert, awake. Wanting to know who, who is it that knows. Is a find that common problem with people. They want a, a name, want to have a name for themselves. To be able to say, I am something rather. Or to try to to say put to get hold of oneself as something, or the knowing as somebody. But all you can do is be alert and awake, and be, and you can't be alert and awake to being alert and awake. You just have to be alert and awake. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the where you where you can reflect. Immediately you try to find out what it is that is alert and awake, who it is. Is it the real me or is it God or is it Buddha or whatever? Then of course you you desire to put a name to it. Or is it conscious? Is it vijnana or or sankara or whatever? have a, is it the five khandhas, or is it a transcendent? But with language, all you can do is, it, language takes us only to, is from the five khandhas, so that it's not a transcendent vehicle. So as far as you can go with language, is that this far. So thinking, words, uh, is uh, are only they have this limitation. They they can kind of point in a direction, but they they have no ability to take you to that. Therefore, you can't you can't know ultimate reality through a definition, through a description, through any words, any symbols. So then, what the words don't do it. If you can't. If somebody can't tell you the ultimate reality, and you can't find it as an object, then what possibly can it be? And you reflect and contemplate, then you begin to be aware of the desire, one thing, desire to know something. Fear, you're aware of fear that drives you to, to seek some kind of refuge in various things various conditions. So the way of the Buddha is the awakened one, the alert, the knowing one, it is the, knows the way it is. And it's in the human form, that's why you can have Buddha Rupas, because you can, Buddhas, uh, is a kind of knowledge that human beings can use. It's not it's not the knowledge only uh, for special kind of creation. So that human beings, you can make, put Buddha, you can put Buddhas into human forms. Now that's, uh, that's saying something to us, isn't it? That, it? that Buddha wisdom isn't a kind of super wisdom for, that uh, Brahmas have because they, they have such refined, radiant qualities that, uh, that they know certain things that we can't possibly know. But note that the Buddha's teaching is always about the most ordinary human experience, not about the most extraordinary human experience. The, the, start, the Four Noble Truths start with the most ordinary common experience to every single one of us, the dukkha. That's significant, isn't it? We contemplate it. Why didn't the Buddha teach, a, teach a, his teaching about the ultimate bliss of the fully enlightened being as the beginning point? 
Or didn't he start with the with the top, with the with the with the ultimate uh, result of the holy life? Why didn't he Why didn't he stress that? That's that's more inspiring, isn't it? The the, the perfection of absolute bliss, eternal happiness. There is no suffering, no pain. Only, only the only the pure bliss of a fully awakened, pure heart. Wow. Then he said, dukkha, old age, sickness, death, grief, sorrow, lamentation, and despair, soka pariteva, tuka tomana, supayasa, dukkha, and starting with this because this is, this is what we must accept before we can experience the other, before we can know the other. Now, during this retreat, huh, some of you hopefully are getting more accepting of dukkha. more willing to look at it, more willing to bear with it, more willing to to uh, fully be with it, rather than to do the usual resisting uh, actions, resentments, creating dukkha upon dukkha. Now, getting up at three o'clock in the morning, somebody might consider dukkha. Because when you think about these things, and of course they, they become if they, if that's something you haven't done before, and you have a negative reaction to it, then of course that is dukkha. You're creating dukkha. But the way of reflection is, you think, is it something immoral? Is it against the precepts to get up at three o'clock in the morning? Is there a precept that you've taken that says, I shall refrain from getting up at three o'clock in the morning? And then you reflect, is, uh, uh, is your, are you uh, physically, is there anything, you know, are you so ill or, or paralyzed or something that you can't do it? Or, is, is this something one must rise to? One must put forth the effort to do this. Now, put it, putting forth the effort, once a, one, ha, one can just do these things. It's, if you really determine, and this is what I, I, I want you to try more and more to do, to make this determination to do it, to get up without a second thought, just for the way of training yourself, see that you can actually do that. But you have to be very firm and not, and not wavering in this determination. And don't give it a second thought, just do it. When the mind will start going into second and third thoughts about it, But just to train oneself, then this will cut through that sleepiness, dullness of mind that so many of you have, where you just caught into dull states all the time, because your mind tends to go into second thoughts all the time about everything. You're not, you're not with, with the actual moments as they are. When you develop a, a mind like a sharp sword that just cuts through things, rather than a blunt kind of instrument which just kind of mashes things up,
bruises them. Now this is a relatively harmless thing to do, getting up at three in the morning. It's not like, not like something that is dangerous or, or uh, getting to getting into something that is will cause any great problems to anyone. It's just, it is it, it is for some some people difficult to do because they they have too many opinions about it, too much resistance to it. So that this is. Uh, this you reflect on. Why? You want to know why one is, doesn't want to do it, why one doesn't feel like doing it, or, one, or one, why, why one resists. Just to note that, that there is this resistance or second thoughts about it. So that we use it as, since it's something given to you, an opportunity for you to rise to, then of course you can, you can say, I'm not going to do it. Venerable Samadha is just taking advantage. And he can just go around saying, get up at three o'clock, we all have to get up at three o'clock. Well, I'll show him. <laughs> you can do that. Go on like that if you want. But the, 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 uh, the training is rising up to the occasion actually use the opportunity because uh, if I didn't give this opportunity you'd never know would you you wouldn't you wouldn't we wouldn't find out about getting up at three o'clock in the morning leaping out of bed with alacrity now in in the Hampstead days when we were there it was uh, the first year it was very kind of depressing time. Now in the winter everything was grey and and Venerable Nando and Viridamo and I were in this grotty house and we we were just getting very apathetic and depressed. We kind of do the morning chanting and but there was no there was no effort in and we were just going through the motions. And then in the day you'd kind of you'd walk up on Hampstead Heath and you'd come back, you'd eat and then you'd drink tea and then people come and talk and and uh, it just was no no kind of spark to the life. It was just a a, a kind of depressing, a dreary scene, and so everything just seemed to be you just try and wanted to sleep a lot and not have to look at anything just to try to avoid having to be with it very much. So I, I began to contemplate, see what was happening, that this was, this was not a, a very good thing, the way it was going. So I decided to, if, you know, the morning chanting had to have, we had to put something, put some effort into it. But to be able to do that, you had to, you couldn't just kind of go up at the last minute and go through the motions of chanting and then just sit there in a dull state. It had to, you had to really do something and so I contemplated it was a cold winter, everything was grey and dreary and the London is in the winter time is is depressing anyway, just the, the visual sight of a big city, cement city, and well, bricks and stones and and grey skies. I contemplated that I didn't like cold. I didn't like to be cold. We tended to huddle around the fires in the house. The last thing I wanted to do was was to take cold showers. But I heard that the Hare Krishnas get up and take cold showers in the early morning. So I thought, that's what I'll do. I'll do what I don't want to do. 
because it's better than doing what I'm doing. So, I I started to, uh, training myself to leap out of bed with alacrity, and to take a cold shower means that in a cold winter's morning, where there's no no heating in the shower room or anything, you can't give it a second thought, otherwise you can't do it. You can't think about it at all, otherwise you just don't do it. So, so I realized, I thought, if I think about whether I want to take a cold shower at four o'clock in the morning, of course, the answer would be, no, I don't. <laughs> and somebody gave me a very nice swan's down duvet and a nice fine little room I could keep nice and warm so I could kind of huddle under these blankets with the fire on and feel nice and cozy. That was a nice feeling. But to, to forego that, to get out of it, rise up, go into the shower room, take my robes off, turn on the cold water, jump into the cold water, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> so I, I pra- started practicing doing that, and it felt, even though it was, it took tremendous kind of willpower. It was, it made me feel very good actually, when I actually did it, and then I felt very, I felt exhilarated, alert. I could go up to, to the morning chanting, feeling really uh, invigorated alert and bright, not the kind of hazy, dull uh, feelings that I was was carrying with me before. Then I do yoga, I always like to do yoga, so I practice standing on my head for like 20 minutes. And that really, and all the blood comes down into the head and everything kind of makes you feel very, very alert, very refreshed. So I told Venerable Anando and Virdham about it. They didn't look terribly excited. <laughs> so I decided, oh, I'd better put the pressure on so I w- would wake them up and they'd have to rush into the shower. And then we'd go and we'd do headstands for 20 minutes and then go up and do the morning chanting. That made an enormous amount of difference to the whole tone of the day. Just that. It didn't take all that long to do. Just starting out the beginning from the time you wake up, putting some real effort uh, into, into getting up and, 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 and waking up and being bright and invigorating everything. So that you can begin the day in a in a in a bright and vigorous state rather than in a depressed and dull one, dull way. But it had to come from we had to do it ourselves. You had to uh, you had to make yourself do it. Go against the, the stream of resistance that was there. There was strong resistance, especially if you're going in a cold shower. The insight was that that one had say in uh, sometimes life is like in in that time the things around were depressing. The the the, the English Sangha Trust, the the place we lived in, the the weather, everything was 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 impinging on us in negative ways. And just contemplate that, and you you look out in a grey rainy street in London and it's cold and and people complain a lot and there's arguments going on and there just everything it was negative that first year. There's so much depressing negative things happening around. And these would 
these would go, you know, be always experiencing this negative impingement. So that you, you know, one that the the on a way unenlightened reaction was to, was to just maybe sleep a lot, or to just try to go off alone and hide, or, or, just uh, drink a lot of tea and coffee, or, or indulge a bit sensually like that, or, or thinking about ways of getting uh, getting away, getting out of it. And of course, the inevitable grumbling result. And there's always just one when things are that way, people start grumbling. There's this kind of grumbling uh, feel. Everybody kind of in this state of complaining, complaining about the weather, complaining about this or that. So then the insight came. That in a situation like this, you had to rise up. You had to be positive, but you had to. You couldn't depend on the things around you to do that for you. You couldn't depend on on the sun shining and the and and a lot of positive uh, reinforcement and confirmation and all that going on. You had to. You had to really rise up and be positive. Do things in a very positive way. Otherwise, you just get pulled down into this mire of negativity. In Thailand, you you could you had a lot of sunshine. Things were um, one could get very depressed and negative there. But the, uh, oftentimes, what was surrounding you was was positive. The people tended to be a very respectful and very uh, giving and generous. So that was a very positive feeling, and you had a lot of respect. Where when we'd walk out of the Hampstead Vihara, we'd get called names. One time, Venerable Nanda was called a drip. Walking along Haverstock Hill, this girl stopped and said, "You're a drip." Well, that would never happen in Thailand. <laughs> Probably depressed him for days. <laughs> and then get, hold, get called Hare Krishna was one of the nicer names. So you go out and you, you're, you're in city life. You've been living in Thailand, wherever you go, people respect you. And then you go to London, where people disrespect you. But in another way, I found it much more of a challenge because suddenly it became very clear that that if 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 I didn't rise up and put forth effort into my life, I wouldn't survive. There's just no question anymore of of uh, of, of just drifting along in that sea uh, of negativity and just getting through, just floating in it, or getting out of it. And getting out of it had to, there was nobody pulling me out, so I had to do it by myself. In other words, had to learn how to swim in that mire, in that sea, and get out of it. Well, that was very good practice, actually, to, to do that. And we, we all benefited from having to put forth a lot of effort Now, when we don't do that, then we can think into, into just complaining and negativity. You can see it in a sangha sometimes, where, where people start uh, complaining, and then it kind of c- contagious, it just spreads through. People are all complaining when something unpleasant happens, or there's some kind of disillusionment. Somebody does something that disappoints us. We can just get caught up in in grumbling and complaining. Now the way of of the Buddha is always by by be letting go of this the arising cause of suffering. 
the second noble truth, <coughs> isn't it? The insight into the second noble truth, the, the letting go or laying aside of the cause of suffering, which is kamadana, pavadana, vipavadana. So this letting go is important. Letting go of our opinions and views and and uh, complaints and all that to rise up to be to be uh, say, to to put forth effort into the situations we're in. Now this this retreat, see, this is the this is up to you to put forth effort into it, not to just drift along in it. but to develop that kind of immediate rising up to the situation, to the standard that's set, using it, uh, developing it, working with it, rather than just being conditioned by it or resisting it. Those are the two inferior ways, resistance and just going through the motions without just because that's easier to do than not to do it. But then the, the, the way of the Buddha is by actually using the situation. Now that example of Hamsid was was a way of using the situation. You contemplate it. You say, what what is it here? They say, well, this is the way it is. It's like this. It's cold. People complain a lot. There's a lot of unpleasant feelings going around. Uh, people are confused. It's winter time. You're in a in a in a in a new place. You've never lived here before. Uh, the future is uncertain. This is the way it is. So then you work with it. You think well. If I just if I just sink into that, just into just react only and resist. If I just react to, the, to all these negative things. Which then I then I just create can more negativity around me. I start grumbling. I think I want to go back to Thailand. I don't think the English can do it. I, these kind of things one can start start just grumbling. The English Sangha Trust or living in London or. Then one starts feeling negative, one starts uh, even uh, picking at things, being a bit kind of bitchy, complaining and just picking away and, and, uh, and, and, and it inevitably leads to quarreling. Now the the image that I and go into it. This is all just a series of of actions without thought.
is doing it without thinking about whether you you feel if you feel you know you never feel like doing those things you just do them <laughs> like going to some uh, taking a cold shower to me is never anything that I want to do or feel like, unless you're in a hot climate Thailand they're very nice where you're all sweaty and hot and it's in nice cool water and you pour these bowls of cold water over yourself, it feels marvelously refreshing. Now that sets the tone for the day so that one doesn't feel, I mean if you do things like that you don't feel all tired and, and dopey and exhausted. Because you're actually starting out in a very, in a very skillful way. Setting the tone, the, the, the way one lives one's life is, is just determined by these little things, how we do things. If we just drift through life, just taking the easiest way, or if we put real effort into it. Now the reflection on this is the way it is, as you can see, is not a, not a kind of apathetic uh, kind of thinking into the way it is, but a, a skillful, alert attention to the way it is. It's not just saying, well, this is the way it is, and go back to sleep. Uh, sometimes people get that impression. He's saying, this is the way it is, in a kind of alert, attentive state, so that you know what's affecting you. You know what it is that is, is surrounding you, what's coming to you, what's affecting your mind. You know, trying to, if you're idealistic, you'd be in Hampstead Bihar, and you're thinking, I shouldn't feel like this, I shouldn't feel depressed, I shouldn't feel apathetic, I didn't feel this way in Thailand. Because ideally, idealistically, you should be uh, the, the ideal bhikkhu, alert, attentive, mindful, humble, courageous, good, fearless, kind, generous, <laughs> all that. And so then you're thinking, I shouldn't, shouldn't be like this, I don't like this, it's, I don't know what's wrong, I think I should maybe go back to Thailand, or... And so you're, you're, you're not really observing how it is, you're just reacting to it. And th therefore you're coming from an ideal of how it should be. You're saying it shouldn't be like this. There shouldn't be any quarrels. Everybody should live in harmony. We're Buddhists. All Buddhists should learn how, Buddhists should learn to live in, in complete happiness and harmony and metta. There shouldn't be any quarrels, any fights in, in, in Buddhist circles. And all bhikkhus should be loving friends and kind, help supporting each other and giving to each other noble-hearted uh, kind of men and all that kind of stuff. You can go on about how everything should be. 
And that's what we do, isn't it? When we, we always, if we hear that somebody in a Buddhist group is having a fight, we think, Buddhists shouldn't fight. It's terrible. <laughs> idea that somehow Buddhists, uh, by calling yourself a Buddhist, gets, gets you out of the human predicament. I wish it did, actually. I wish it was that easy. Just go around calling myself a Buddhist and suddenly I, I didn't feel argumentative or resistant to anything. I was just in a state of blissful tranquility forever. This is saying, I'm a Buddhist, and suddenly you you never feel like you want to quarrel with anyone. You're always in harmony with everything, and in a state of perfect bliss forever. Wouldn't it be nice if it was that easy? So that the, the this is the way it is reflection, is it, that in any the human situation, the world, the earth, planetary life, Britain, uh, all these things that we're involved in now. It's like this. It's this way, it's, which is, which is, remind us to look at it, to observe how it is, not to judge it and say, if it isn't what it should be, that we should we, uh, just be critical and, and resistant to it. But this, this, this is the way it is, reflection, brings our attention to what's affecting us right now, the good or the bad, or the neutral. Working with life as it happens to us means that we can. We have to know how it is to be able to do it. There's mindfulness, isn't it? Bringing attention to the way things are, both internally to the, to the character traits, the tendencies, the habits of, that, that one might have, and to the, the, the group that one's living with and the society that one, one's living in. To the very fact that we're living on planet, we have these very these bodies that are planetary bodies and follow the laws of a, of the planet. This is the way it is. An ideal body, what well, shouldn't uh, shouldn't be sick, shouldn't uh, we can think of a kind of idealized uh, human bodies that we have. They're all they're all kind of beautiful images in the mind. They're usually associated with, with beauty and good health. But note how that so much of more and more seeing that, that the body is, it, it gets old, it grows up, it, get, it, it gets born, it grows up, gets old and dies. And seen with uh, Sister Dasania, this, uh, the effect of illness cancer. Nanda was a good example of old age, of what happens when the body gets old. It's the upala. Contemplate, this is the way it is. Think this is, well, there shouldn't be cancer, should there? We shouldn't have it. Not right that there's cancer. On the ideal plane, of if, if I'd created the earth and made it all, I wouldn't have created cancer, actually. <laughs> right now, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't have created cancer. So I'm going by my own views and opinions about what should and should not be. There's a lot of things that exist uh, that I would that I wouldn't have created if I were God. 
But they say because I didn't have much to do, much to say about it. God didn't consult me about what he what was worthy of creating, and that never came to me and says, "Tomato, do you think I should create cancer or not?" I say, "No, God." <laughs> Don't do that. Create maybe some kind of thing that you get uh, that makes you like, kind of the reverse of cancer, where the cells of your body, rather than getting more obstreperous and difficult, they become more kind of ethereal and beautiful. Wouldn't that be nice? And then we'd all be dying to get it. Rather than dine with it, <laughs> so that whether we think, I don't believe in a god that would create cancer. I have nothing more to do with God because He created cancer. Some people go to that extreme. They say if there was a god, there wouldn't be any cancer. So because there is, it proves that there isn't any god at all, or that God has somehow failed us because. If he really loved us, like he said, he wouldn't allow cancer to exist. But the Buddhist position is: is this is the way? Is cancer is like this? There is the this is the the, the body uh, is is in this state. This is the way it feels. It's like this. See that that is the way of a Buddha by reflecting. Learning from the way it is, knowing how it is, not not uh, advising on how it should be. So, in our reflection this morning, this is the way it is. It's like this: life at Amravati, the, the winter time, Britain. Uh, the nuns, the monks, the community, this is the way it is. Then we can refrain from giving it a second thought, in, in the sense of reacting to either being attached, uh, infatuated, or averse to it, or critical of it. We, can, we, have, a, we have something to see something to use as a background in order to see what we create onto it. At this time, at this place, this is the way it is. We can reflect, are we cold or, or warm? Is it, are we feeling uh, awake or dull? Are we feeling healthy or unhealthy? We reflect on the way it is, so we, we're noting Noting how it is, what it is affecting us. If the body right now is feeling sickly and tired and all that, then that's the way it is. You know that this is what's affecting the mind. That this is going to have, you know, it's impinging on consciousness. It's, it's conscious. Rather than than thinking, I, it, I wish it weren't like this, one can bear with it and accept it as it is.
I think that's one one thing that was very helpful living in Thailand was the the Thai people tend to be much more that way they're more accepting of life and naturally they're uh, I remember uh, when I was a novice and in Nong Kai a Lao army general, air force general from a southern town in Savannakhet because he was angry and annoyed with the with the uh, with the air force in Vientiane, it was it was the same. It was the Royal Lao uh, Air Force. It wasn't the communists. Anyway, this general flew up and bombed and destroyed some buildings on the air force base in Vientiane. His own people, his own his own side. And, and at that time, Laos was in a very shaky state. Already, it had so many problems with the, with the communists, and, and then the Americans were there, and in and, and, and the Royal Lao military forces, they couldn't, they couldn't even fight it among themselves. So I say, that's despicable, terrible thing to do. How can they do that? That's just not right. It shouldn't be like that. It's going on like that, and this monk. I was talking to, looked at me, and he says, but that's the way it is, isn't it? It's the way life is. <laughs> and he seemed so accepting of it, and life reacted. First, I became indignant. He doesn't care. He just says, that's the way it is. <laughs> and then I realized what I was doing. Suddenly, in that, in that cool reflection, I saw this, this other silly fool that was going on. It shouldn't be like this. Not that I could do anything about it. You know, I wasn't about prepared to go and talk to the army general or put any effort into solving the problem. Anyway, I had no, didn't feel that I was in a position that anyone would listen. And I didn't really want to have to go and, and, and uh, tell them how, what they should do. But I was getting all kind of heated up and indignant over something. And then I contemplated, I thought, why would he, that monk say that? I, because that's the way it is. Human beings have been doing that all the time. History of, of uh, every nation is filled with incidents like that, of jealousies and, and betrayals and all that. It's just so much a part of, of the human experience. From an ideal position, it shouldn't be that way. From a real position, that's the way it is. These things happen. And they affect in this way. Now, when there's, when there's this understanding, well, the, the ideal, and not that, that we shouldn't have ideals, but we had the ideals are guides and then reflection is for understanding how it is. So you can move toward the ideal, but not just blindly grasp ideas. Like with us in our lives as monks and nuns, we're not just justifying heedless and sloppy and stupid behavior by saying that's the way it is. But we are recognizing that at that's the way it is when it's present, not as justification or as a, a, a uh, or just uh, or as uh, that this is what we should be doing because that's the way it is. But when we accept it and know that this is the way it is now, we can rise up beyond that. If our if our attitude, if our behavior is not say worthy or good or or in, in, uh, moving toward the ideal of being the awakened, the alert, the all-enlightened one. There's a difference, isn't there? And you say, this is the way it is, which means justifying anything that's happening, so you don't have to put forth any effort, and just kind of float in it. Or saying, this is the way it is, in order to see it, 
so that you can rise up and not be just stuck in it, into it. But if you're attached to ideals, then you're just you just become critical and indignant, exasperated with the way it is. Which usually means you're totally incapable of doing anything about it or improving anything. You just you just add to the confusion. You just make it worse. So if somebody comes in here and and sees see something they don't like and they just start complaining it shouldn't be like this and then they what they say but maybe they're right maybe in that way they're right it shouldn't be like this but because they don't understand how things are they don't really understand why it is this way or that they they just are coming in and putting a some idealistic judgment onto a situation. And because of that, they just become critical and indignant and and they create more problems. They cause more misery, more frustration to everyone. Where the wise wise being comes in and observes. When, whenever you go to somebody else's place. Say if you go to some other Buddhist monastery or religious group, you know, we can go with this idea of criticizing, saying it shouldn't be like this, they shouldn't be like that, and comparing it with ours. Or, But the wise samana will be the one who just goes with an open mind to, to know how it is to get the feeling for the way it is. So then, if there's any opportunity for suggestions to improve it, and they ask, then we can do so. If they want us to know how they can, what we think or what uh, we have any ideas for improvement, then we can, we can offer them. But it saves us from this dreadful kind of oppressive patronizing and and uh, criticizing overbearing tendencies that we can easily be lost into. And, uh, note these two, the ideal and the real, are not conflicting, are they? Not like you have to make a choice, be an idealist or a realist, but to reflect from that to you, that the, the, they work together. Realism without idealism is is really boring, and and, uh, and it doesn't it doesn't. And there's nothing to work for. There's nothing to move up to. You just kind of just learn to to walk in the mud forever. There's no chance of ever getting out of it. Idealism without without understanding of the realities of the way things are, just makes you critical and frightened, neurotic. But working together is the way of a Buddha, so that, that here in Amaravati, one can have ideals and be quite realistic at the same time. They're not they're not in conflict. 